And this week we've got um, James Henderson and Laura Fole, uh, who's the uh, managers of uh, Lowland Investment Trust, amongst others, um, to talk to. So it should be quite interesting to hear what they have to say about UK equity income. Um, I've got a few little bits of news to do. One of the things that we've been bad at is, is not putting these property screeners on the front. So I should highlight these, uh, and they should now be all over the place. But um, the, the key message here, which I won't go into every week, is basically to say that this is not intended to um, get you to buy anything that you we talk about here. Uh, it's just to sort of um, spur some thought and encourage you to think about it. Um, so let's get going. This week, um, not a lot of news actually on the investment company front, nothing particularly exciting anyway. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about was Biopharma Credit because it's just activated uh, a discount control mechanism, which is a slightly unusual uh, version of one of these. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, just to sort of broaden out a bit, bring in our property analyst, Richard Williams. Um, he's been working with us for about a year now. Um, so a couple of things we want to talk about there. So one is the UK office market because uh, one of the funds that we cover has just um, sold its last office investment in London. And what does that kind of mean for the office market? And the other thing news this morning is that the big shopping centre company into looks set to be um, going to administration, um, having been really quite a big company at one point. So um, that's what we'll cover, and then we'll, then we'll talk to Lomond. So far, I'm a credit first. Um, as you can see here, this it's in the, the sort of direct lending sector of um, uh, the investment um, companies arena. Um, within that, there are all sorts of things making all sorts of different kind of loans. It's quite unique because it's lending to um, biotech companies. Um, and you also see here that it's actually trading on one of the tightest discounts. So it might seem strange that it's um, activated a discount control mechanism. But it is, I think, quite important that these things trade a bit like bonds. That's, that was the idea of them when they um, came in. Um, and therefore, you'd hope that they really wouldn't um, have very big discounts at all. Of course, obviously, the problem we've got is that you're seeing actual defaults on some of these. And some of these have just given up and they're just going to wind up and give the money back. And you've seen, I suppose, the fear of prospective defaults and a whole load of um, different loan funds as well because of what's going on with COVID-19. Um, fortunately, though, biopharma credit should be not much affected. So here's the returns. Um, so you can see that the um, NAV returns are, have been actually quite fine. I've blanked out the returns on VPC speciality lending here because Morningstar is going to mistake on those at the moment. And there are perennial things we have to do is to keep them in line with in terms of the data that they provide us. But you can see that actually the, the returns of biopharma credit are actually quite respectable. Um, Here's the charts, the NEV TEF return is the purple one and the price in pink, and you can see how that um, gets out of it as the discounts emerged. Um, it actually did go to move to trading at a quite a big premium to sell off with, as we'll see later on. Um, it's funding life sciences companies, um, and this is obviously a very specialist area. And because it's a very specialist area, it means that the um, underwriting of the loans is quite complex too. And they're certainly sort of a, a narrow group of field of people who can comfortably do that. So normal bank would feel very uncomfortable if they can use them for loans, for example. Because there's less competition, that means they get higher rates. And so this is why they think they can make loans at quite attractive yields um, without compromising too much on risk. Um, it's quite an experienced team. They had the um, funds before they launched by a farmer. Targeting 8 9% annual returns and the 7% yield on the issue price. Um, so, really quite cool. And um, one of the things that I was slightly wary of when it launched was that it was not very well diversified. So, it, it raised a huge amount of cash and actually kept issuing stock. So, it expanded a few times as well. Um, and it had a pre existing portfolio that it did. Um, can invest in. So you can see that they're the yellow and lighter blue numbers here in the IPO column. Um, but a huge amount of cash at the beginning. 
And then it started to de deploy that. Uh, and one of the first things it invested in was um, a loan to a company called Desaro, uh, which is the grey one you can see here and here. Um, and that was uh, an interesting investment, but one of the things I was worried about was the just the concentration of risk in the fund. Um, and even back in 2018, you can see that Cesaro is a huge chunk of the portfolio. Um, fortunately, I suppose for Biopharma, but well, it's a problem and a, uh, an opportunity. Um, Cesaro got taken over by Draxo, and that meant that the um, loan got repaid early. So they um, got a huge chunk of money back. Um, they, they earned extra interest because of um, sort of prepayment penalties built into the loan structure, but they had to deploy that. But the upshot of that is um, roll forward another year, and actually we've got a much more diversified portfolio. Um, so the, the still got a fair chunk of cash. Um, there's no gearing associated with this. Um, but the biggest investment now is uh, this Serexa thing here, which I think of. So it's pretty easy if I explain what that does, and then explains kind of what Biofarm is looking at. So, um, Serepta makes um, a couple of drugs aimed at treating Duchenne muscular, muscular dystrophy. Um, the one of the, the, the way that the muscular dystrophy works is there's um, a problem with the gene that um, makes dystrophy, which is um, something involved in, in how muscles work. And so they think they've got drugs that can help replicate what their dystrophy would have done, and that that um, helps treat the problem. So um, two big drugs. You can see down here um, from the pipeline of, of sales that um, they estimate that this drug is just one of these drugs is going to get, and um, very rapidly. The, the loan, which they're talking about up to $500 million, um, is going to be way covered just by annual cash flow. So you can see how um, there's, there's gamble's the wrong word, but, but there's a, a sort of a risk at the beginning that if suddenly this thing got pulled, um, that there'd be a problem um, trying to cover the, the loan. But obviously, we haven't met the whole $500 million yet. Um, and then as the sales ramp up, then they can draw down more money, um, but it should all be quite well covered. Um, and for that, Biofirma credit gets uh, an 8.5% coupon. And then these extra chunks that it gets make quite a big difference to its income as well. So it takes another 1.75 um, when the money is drawn down by the borrower. And then it gets another 2% if it's prepaid early. Uh, even better than that, or when it's, so when it's repaid at all, sorry. If it's prepaid early, which is this thing down the bottom here, um, they get whatever they would have earned in the first two years. So if it got repaid tomorrow, they get all of the interest they would have earned for two years. Um, plus, they get an extra 2% if it's repaid before the full anniversary. So that's really quite chunky income, and that's, that's why this thing uh, makes so much money. Um, but you can see the kind of risk involved is, is the risk around, is this drug any good? Will something come along to replace it? Um, will it have to get pulled because of the unexpected side effects? But obviously, that's where they're doing all the analysis to try and make sure it doesn't happen. Um, so it, it traded a decent premium for much of its life. Uh, that's, this is the whole history of the fund um, until very recently. And it's just the normal sell-off that occurs um, with the COVID stuff. Everything seemed, you know, everybody seemed to panic at the same time. Everything sold off together. Um, but the share price hasn't quite made it back to asset value. And it's got this discount control mechanism that basically says, as it says there, if the shares trade at 5% uh, on average over three months, then provided it's paying out its 7% dividend, it's going to use half of the money and income that it gets back from in loans to buy back shares until the discount averages at 1% for two-week period. That's quite an aggressive um, discount control mechanism, but actually I think quite a cool one. Um, there's obviously uh, the, there's the first protecting the dividend income, and then after that they, they're just really throwing everything at the problem to try and take the discount. Um, and I, I quite like that, so I, it's me taking walks with me by the time I So um, that's that. Now let's talk to about property. Um, I'm going to.
first on the Richard. There we are. There we go. Hi, Richard. Good morning. Hi. Uh, okay, thanks, Dave. So, yeah, um, so we're going to talk a bit about UK commercial property and what it's doing in um, offices in London, please. Yeah, so um, yeah, they, UK commercial property REIT sold the last remaining uh, City of London office this week. That's Elden House. Um, sold for 40 million, which is 3.6% below its um, March valuation, um, but the, but they'll, they'll say they sold it because um, it, it was at the natural end of its property life cycle. They acquired it in 2015, carried out um, refurbishment and let up all the, the vacant space and re-geared the leases, and and that's the that's the cycle that they 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 do. They take on asset management projects take them through to full um, full occupancy and then and then sell them on. So the timing for them couldn't have been better really to sell this in the current market at a, a it's it's down on valuation but not not too bad. And um, and given the uh, the cloud that's over the uh, office sector at the moment it's it's a pretty good time for them to, to come out. Um as you see on them on, the, on this slide, the um, COVID COVID nineteen impact um, has been huge for the office sector. Everyone working from home, um, corporates have put on hold their um, office move requirements and, and are now even sort of assessing their space requirements going into the future with people sort of um, blending gov coming into the office and working from home. Do they need that amount of space um, and the stats that I've seen so far for um, for the take up in Q2 is 88% down on the um, on the same period last year. So that that is is all due to the the impact of COVID-19. But <clears throat> there'll there'll be trends that that, um, that are long lasting following this. The obvious one as you see on on the next slide. The obvious one um, being that um, people will work from home a lot more now. So um, for the smaller office space requirements, we saw this week that um, the London Mayor Sadiq Khan said that they're relocating City Hall to the east of London, much smaller office. So um, that, that shows that, um, I mean, assuming there's no job cuts, that shows that they're planning to have a lot more of their employees working from home. Um, a host of banks as well are assessing the size of their HQ. So I'm moving forward. I can see a lot, a lot more, um, corporate head offices in London being, being smaller. Um, there's also been talk of a hub and spoke model or, or satellite offices whereby they have, um, they have their HQ in the centre of London, but have a, have offices or an office around London, so employees don't have to um, get on to um, busy and packed trains um, and things like that. Um, which there has been a couple of um, examples of that, of, of companies looking at um, offices around London in the home counties and stuff. I think um, Santander said they were looking at that one, um, and and that. Again, that's a, an obvious benefit for the occupier because um, obviously rents are, are cheaper in, in the South East compared to London, up to about 60% cheaper. So they can cut their HQ in London and have a, a second office in, in, the, uh, in the surroundings of London that's 60% cheaper, then, then that could be a trend that sticks. Um, and also that, <clears throat> although you see the headlines with WeWork and stuff like that. There could be an in increased demand for um, service offices going forward due to the fact that, that companies can flex their space up and down when they when they need it and when they don't need it. And, and to do that, service offices are, are the perfect place for their short contracts um, and they can come out and go into them when they need. So that could be a trend going into the future. <clears throat> What, what does this all mean for um, 
the property companies then that are, are big in, in London obviously as well. As you can see on the next slide, these are the this is the share prices of um three London focused property companies, um Go and London, Great Portland and Helical. And you can see that the mar what the market thinks already the the share price has, has come off since um COVID nineteen and um and hasn't come back. Um so there's 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 definite um concerns around the market. In the short term there's going to be reduced demand for space which which will mean falling rents and, and falling capital values. In the long term the the jury's still out um but as I said earlier we're probably going to see less space requirements um so which will mean oversupply and the realignment of rent downwards um which has been which we've seen um, happen in the retail sector um, in these last few years, um, which which um, leads me on to the news of Into today. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they've announced today that um, they're likely to fall into administration today, um, having not been able to um, come to any agreement with their creditors. Um, I mean, the writing has been on the wall for into for months, um, and it's just been accelerated by COVID-19. They, um, their debt pile was huge. They, they piled on the debt during the retail hay heyday of the sort of 2010s, um, and, and failed to see the e-commerce, um, boom coming. Um, it's got four and a half billion pounds of debt. Um, which you could say was manageable when their portfolio was worth 10 billion, as it was, but those values have been plummeting in recent years. Um, their last valuation was 6.6 .6 billion, uh, giving it a sort of a loan to value of about 68%. So they obviously, um, breached several of their debt covenants and have been sort of at the mercy of the, uh, the banks ever since they they tried a, um, an emergency cash call earlier this year of about 1.5 billion which failed um they've been trying to negotiate waivers with the banks and standstills and and um, that's finally come to an end today or is likely to um it means if, if they do go into administration which they said today is likely um it'll mean the administrators taking over the running of the malls um, and will probably um, result in the fire sale of assets, likely at um, discounted values. And I mean that's another hammer blow for the for the um, shopping centre sector with values already plummeting. If they start selling assets at big discounts, um, that would have a, a, a massive impact on, on other shopping centre owners and, and the sector more more widely. Um, it's important to stress that um, that Intu's problems were all, all self-made. Um, they, like I said, they they piled on the debt, um, and and this was going to be a likely outcome if we had COVID-19 or not. Um, this would just accelerate the process. Property companies that have a um, conservative debt, debt level, which the majority do in the listed property sector. I think they're in a, a good place to ride out this storm um, where, as and when we sort of get back to normality on rent collections um, and, and collecting in the deferred rent that, that they've agreed over the past few months. Um, those with low um, debt levels should be able to ride out this storm. So I don't, I don't see a, a wider um, num number of companies failing due to COVID-19, it, it would just mean events will be um, pushed on into sort of next year. Okay, cool. Um, there's, actually, just quickly, there's a couple of questions popped up on this. So, um, yeah. one of them says, it just says, will office spaces simply become meeting areas and hot desks rather than daily workspaces? Um, I don't think so. Um, I don't know about you, but I think um, 
the office as a, a place for sort of creativity and collaboration and and things like that it's, it's definitely still a um will definitely be a, a, a trend going forward i think more likely like i said earlier with the serviced office space that there could be a pickup in in demand for that because like like the question said people people may strip out their sort of meeting spaces and things like that in their head offices and just use sort of service offices as a when for um, contract work or, or or things like that when they need to scale up the business or scale down the business they can get rid of it quickly instead of being tied into a sort of 10 year lease on their headquarters they can get rid of the service office quickly so I think that might be a trend that picks up going forward. Okay, cool. Um, and then the other two are really around uh, what alternative use do offices have? I suppose the obvious one is residential. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're obviously, um, most of them are pretty central, especially London. Um, central London offices w would have a huge um, alternative use value for residential. Um, we're seeing that quite a lot in with, with, with retail as well um, more in the sort of retail parks and retail warehouses sort of from the edge of towns um, their alternative use values are coming um, for residential and, and also logistics is, are becoming really um, prominent at the moment um, just because of their location um, so yeah I can see that coming more of a trend as well cool all right, thanks very much for that. Um, Thank you. We shall hear from, more from you in future weeks. Um, so let's now talk to um, our Lola managers. Let's make sure they can talk first. James? Hello. Hello, James. And Laura? Yeah, can you hear me all right? Yes, thank you. Very good. Great. Well, thanks very much for... Um, Coming on, um, so I think we just sort of gentle introduction first off. Do you want to sort of just give us a brief um, a history of, of um, Lowland and because it's it's not one of the oldest investment trusts that you manage, um, and it's a, it's interesting. I think. Do you want to say something about that, James? Yes, um, I've, I've managed it since 1990. It, it started in the six, 1960s. Um, it, at Henderson's, interestingly, in the early days, it was always given to a young manager. I suppose I've kept going for rather too long, but Laura is working with me. Um, it was always given to a young manager because income funds had a discipline. You bought things when they were out of fashion and good value, and you sold them when yields fell um, uh, because the price the company had become fashionable and was become highly rated. And that was always thought to be a good discipline. And for much of my career, it has been a good discipline. It hasn't been a good discipline for the last five years, where the, um, the higher rated stocks have gone on up, and it's been much more um, challenging finding stocks in the, in the yield sector and in the, with out of favoured stocks. We've always run a long list of stocks. It's always been about large, medium and small companies. Over time, the, the small companies have actually given very good returns, but they've done it in a volatile manner. They, they've had periods when they, they've been in favour and they've had periods when they've been out of favour, um, particularly the yielding type of small company. Um, these are often more, a bit more cyclical than, mm. than other companies. Um, and they, th those companies in the downturn do suffer, but they look at themselves they, they get focused on their costs and they recover well. Um, and Lowland has traditionally performed well coming out of down cycles. Um, but at, um, at the moment, we're in, we are suffering in the UK with the UK centric nature of the portfolio, but we are finding opportunities. Yeah, I, can, I can remember periods when Lowland's been one of the best performing funds, definitely. Um, yes. As you say, yeah, not so much recently. I suppose, um, I mean, the reason why it's so fascinating to talk to you at the moment is because everybody's wondering about income. We've seen 
bond yields falling again, interest rates at zero, um, and lots of big companies have cut their dividends. Um, so it's how do you actually navigate through that um, scenario? It does seem like investment companies are doing much better, but do you want to say something about how you're actually coping with the moment? Well, you know, it is, it is great running uh, an uh, investment trust in these situations because you have got that revenue reserve and we are looking through the next period thinking, will the actual earnings recover to the dividend? And perhaps, Laura, you, 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 you give some colour to that. Sure. So, I mean, to put, to put it in a bit of context, this year consensus has dividends in the UK market down about 35%. So that's you know, materially worse than the financial crisis. I think what's becoming clearer now is what sectors won't be paying. So we, we now have, have a pretty good idea of what companies will and won't pay dividends. But the, the bigger question, the next question effectively, is, is when dividends come back and at what pace they come back. And that's really where there's a bit of a debate in the market at the moment with some people thinking that dividends will fall again next year and analyst consensus having it as dividends rising about 20%. We, we think the latter, that dividends will recover at least to a degree next year. And um, for a couple of reasons, you know, some companies that we own, like RSA, have been very public about their desire to get back to paying a dividend. Um, you know, privately, some other companies like Direct Line have said the same. Uh, and then also some companies like the bank have been explicitly barred from paying a dividend this year, this calendar year, but might return to the list in some sense next year. So we think the dividends will, will recover a little bit in 2021, but, but not to 2019 levels. I think the way we've always managed Lowland is that income is an output. So, so focus on growing the capital and always see income as coming from that capital growth. And so ultimately, the, the dividend decision and future dividends for Lowland will come down to whether to what we think is best for capital growth. Um, because what we're finding at the moment is that the best in our view, the best total return opportunities are in those companies that tend to have suspended their dividends. Not, not exclusively, but just generally we're finding the best opportunities in those areas. Because what we're finding is that those companies that are still paying a dividend, um, you know, things like utility companies or pharmaceutical companies, for want of a better word, they're very picked over by income funds because there's so few companies. Well, there's such a narrow area of the market now that is still paying a dividend that we think that the more sort of undervalued, overlooked area of the market at the moment is those that aren't paying a dividend, which is quite, obviously that's quite difficult for an income for to say, but I think that is where we're finding the best total return opportunity at the moment. So um, the, I think the yield at the moment now is about 6%, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, if we've paid 60p. Almost really. <laughs> that's it. Um, so, Obviously, you've got the reserves on it. Well, actually, how much have you got in revenue reserves? How, what sort of... Um... Yeah, so basically, as that, um, the financial year end is September, and then we had 18.4 million, which is about 68p per share. But to be a bit careful with that number, because it's before paying out the third... In so we pay quarterly dividend, mm -hmm. and that number is before paying the third interim dividend and the final. So the true revenue reserve number is more like low 50 pence per share compared to a dividend that we paid last year of... 59 and a half p so say we paid 60 p this year we've got about 80 percent odd of a year sat in the reserve um we've added to that a lot since the financial crisis we've added about 11 million since the financial crisis and not used it at all since 2010 um so i think that that ultimately that revenue reserve is shareholders money that we haven't distributed um, and we're well aware that as an investment trust you know as james mentioned we're in a lot stronger position um, than a, an open-ended fund would be. And for anyone that's got five minutes, we've recently put out our half-year report. And basically what the chairman said in his statement is that it's our firm intention to maintain the dividend policy if possible. And by if possible, what we're trying to get across is if it's in the best interest of shareholders. You know, can we continue with the investment policy um, that we think will generate the best total return while still paying that dividend? What's, what's your view on paying dividends out of capital as a sort of general rule? Because obviously there are some funds that do that. Do you, do you much prefer to actually earn the income you distribute? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, we would prefer it to become from income. We don't want to chip away at the capital. Going back to that point 
Laura was making, everything we're buying, we're buying because we're wanting to grow the capital. And in the end, real good sustainable income comes from growing the capital, having a bigger pool of capital. Um, so the zero yielders we're buying, you know, I'm hoping that a lot of them will come back onto the dividend list in 2022. And, you, and actually, you'll see the earnings recover when those come back onto the dividend list. I think we it would it would be a bored decision, but I think I can firmly say that I would be if the advice if they asked me for my advice on it would not to pay it out of capital income income is 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 there as a product of capital and grow the capital would be would be what I'd want to do that's the way to get out of the problem sure okay that makes sense to me um one of the things i mean obviously this is not the first time that We've seen a big hole in UK equity income. I, I remember the uh, BP Deepwater Horizon dividend cut and uh, going back to the 90s and Midland Bank passing its dividend. And so, so these things do happen from time to time. Are there constraints involved in, in running a pure UK equity income fund that um, bind your hands too much? I think it was. Very gentle. I think for me, the length of the list and being in medium and smaller companies uh, um, gets around that problem. You know, there are going to be, the UK economy is in, a, is, is in a difficult place at the moment, but there will out of this slowdown emerge some really good smaller companies. It's our job to find those smaller companies. Um, and that, that means running a, a relatively long list. Some companies will recover. They will reinvent themselves in this difficult time and come back at bigger and stronger companies. So for me, I agree. If you were running just big companies, you are limited into a narrow range of stocks. But we, 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 we will find companies on AIM. Some of our, our best investments in recent years have come from AIM-type companies, um, Johnson Service Group. As, as a company that has been a big success over the years. Churchill China, again, you know, a family controlled company when first bought on a good yield. You know, the family members always like to get a dividend. Um, so, and it, it has been a, a very successful as, and grown and grown from the UK. It's now operating successfully internationally selling internationally it's that kind of business that can give you the variety the diversity um, away from just the, simply the big stocks w would you like to add to that Laura yeah no I think that's right and if you went back and looked historically at the payout ratios the, the dividend payout ratios if you looked at the FTSE 250 and FTSE small cap it never quite got to the high payout ratio that the FTSE 100 did so I think what you've seen going into the crisis is that small and medium-sized companies have been quicker to cut their dividends. You know, as Jane said, they're generally more cyclical. They don't often have the same balance sheet reserves as some of their larger cap peers. But what I think you might see is that they're quicker to restore the dividends to the level they were before. This isn't the case at university, I'm generalising, um, but generally they didn't get to that. You know, FTSE 100 was at a 60 to 70% payout ratio going into all of this. FTSE 250 and below never got to that point. So I think you will see the dividends hopefully restored quicker at that smaller cap end. And I'm really glad that if Lowlands, to give you a bit of context, we explicitly say in the investment objective that we won't normally have more than half in the FTSE 100. Um, and I think that breadth is, is really important at the moment in terms of giving us the choice of dividends across the market. Um, because if you were just restricted to the FTSE 100, the, the list of dividend payers is pretty narrow now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, and I think what you're doing is it does definitely makes sense to me. And um, we should sort of maybe just dive straight into questions because there's some coming through now that sort of make sense to what I was going to ask about now. So um, let's let's do first. So to what happened in the um, the sell-off in um, February March? Did you were you trading much then? Um, Yes, um, in, we weren't net investors, but what we were doing is adding to quite a few of the weaker names on what look like, you know, so far to be good levels. Um, so Lowland has quite a high weighting in industrials and financials. It has done for a long time. Uh, we took the opportunity to add to quite a few of our industrial names at, at really quite low valuations versus history of 
it's hard to know what the, the PE will be this year because we don't really know what the E is going to be. But if you use historic measures like EV sales for businesses where we don't think they're structurally impaired, I mean, we were buying in, in really March, sort of mid-March onwards, at, at what looks to us to be, to be pretty attractive levels. Um, and the same with some of the financials we added to some of our insurance names. We took a new position in RSA and we added a position in Aviva. You know, harking back to the dividend point, these are ones that both RSA and Aviva have suspended their dividends, but we think they'll return to the list fairly quickly. And when they do, we think the yields that we're buying, these companies that will look really attractive. I mean, the sort of sector tilt in portfolios, does that just come out of, of the stocks that you see that are attractive? Or is there any kind of deliberate bias involved? We're looking we're looking for overall blend of risk in the portfolio. So we, we want and we want diversity. But um no the, the sectors we don't think today we're going to have ten percent in insurance. We we're looking for opportunities across the insurance sector across the market and we, we at the moment we're finding we found quite a few in, in the insurance area. The same with industrials. The, the, Industrials co cover a lot of very different companies. The industrial weighting is really the result of a lot of individual stock decisions in a lot of you, uh, um, feature, a lot of different end markets are featured in those, those companies. So no, we're not sector driven, we're, but we are after blend. We don't, we like blend of risk. So it's different end markets matter rather than strict sector disciplines. Cool. Okay, that makes sense. And did, what, what do you do about the gearing? Have you uh, adjust that from time to time in, 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 of what's happened the last few months? So on a percentage, oh, sorry, John. No, you go, on a percentage basis, the gearing hasn't changed too much. So today it's between 13 to 14 percent, which if you went back over the last 10 years or so, it would be about mid-teens on average gearing. So it's not too different. Um, on a pound spent basis, we've taken a small amount out of the gearing year to date. Um, it's pretty minor in the scheme of things. Um, and where we've done that, we've tend to reduce names that have been historically good performers for the portfolio. So to give you an example, you know, we've held a position in Avon Rubber for a very long time and it does defence equipment. It's, it's acted defensively. It's been a good performer. And we've just reduced that a little bit in order to rotate into those, um, you know, the RSAs, the Avivas that I mentioned. Do any of the um, sort of more defensive things look expensive to you now? Um, yes, some of them would. I mean, Avon is undoubtedly a good company, um, very well managed, and it did a deal. It bought the business from 3M that looked a very good deal. Um, but, you know, where the rating is now, I think it's fair to say, James, we're, we're both probably a bit surprised by the rating that it's got to. Um, especially yeah. given the scale of the company. I think what it's effectively doing is pricing in another deal. Um, so, yeah, there are a few of the defensive names, but where what we're doing is just going slowly when it comes to reducing them, because um, what we've found in the last few years is that we tend to reduce quite early because of the valuation discipline that we've got. Um, where we've made some mistakes in the last few years is, is reducing names like that too quickly. So we're trying to counteract that and just go slowly where we are reducing them. Avon is 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 interesting. You're going back to your your saying that the limited number of opportunities. It came on it came in as a yield stock. People say you can never get technology in the UK. Actually, what what differentiates something like Avon and has led to its success is is its masks. Is it, and they they do have a technology, not a not a technology in the sense. Um, or, that you get in computing, but it, it, they make a better mask. The filters work better. That's how they've sold over the years. And it was it was their development over many years of producing masks that gives them the edge. So technology in its broad sense can be found in the income sector. Um, and the best companies always have some sort of edge. And it usually comes with technology in its broadest sense. Um, it's now a highly rated company and that's why we, we slowly reduced to recycle into hopefully another company like that in time that, that has got some real good edge 
and that will come out over the years um, uh, with increased sales and increased margins. And the UK will have stocks like that in this downturn. They're there. We just have to work hard to find them at the moment. Do you think the UK market looks particularly cheap relative to, to global markets? I do. Um, it's underperformed very markedly. There are there are serious issues in the, the economy. There is a lot of uncertainty. But in the end, it, 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 you're not you're not buying the economy with the, in the UK stocks. You're buying individual companies with individual management teams that will find a way through. Um, the, the good ones will find a way through. And actually, you're buying them on ratings. I've not seen since I, I started managing Lowland in 1990. Um, and, actually, and the normalized dividend yields they're on, I think is also higher than I've ever known them before. Uh, by normalized, I mean when we get through the, the current, the current um, volatility in dividends. Hmm. An exciting times then. I mean, I'm actually, this, these two things are linked together, I one on the, but um, I suppose people are just keen to know what else you mean to buying, I suppose. Um, I've got a question here about where I've seen you selling. So, uh, any, any other kind of portfolio news you want to talk about? Shall I start and then yeah. you can pick yeah. a few that you like? And if, if you look at some of the areas that we've been adding to, aside from insurance, um, this harks back to what your property analyst was saying. We, we've actually been adding a small amount to land securities. We did already hold it, but we've added to it quite materially over the last few months. Um, it's, it's both retail and offices. But it's trading at about a 55% discount to its NAV. And bear in mind that NAV has already been brought down quite markedly. Um, so one way of, of looking at it, if you could almost say the retail um, or near enough zero, and, and this is quite prime retail asset. You know, it seems like one new change in St. Paul's, which is, is basically restaurants and cafes anyway, rather than traditional kind of clothing retail. Um, and the office assets that it has are a pretty prime office asset. I I slightly disagree with with your analyst. Um, I don't. I think that the sort of the death of offices is a bit overdone. And um, something like Land Securities has been such a poor performer and went into this with a pretty strong balance sheet. Um, it's one of these ones that has suspended its dividends. But to James's point, I think once it returns to paying the dividend yield that we'll be buying it at now will look really quite attractive. Um, so that's one area. And in the smaller company area, there are a few names that we've added to and a few new names. So something like Ricardo is one that we've added to. It's been very weak year to date. Um, for those that don't know it, it's a consultancy business. It does environmental consultancy. Um, so say you're a company that wants to reduce their water usage, for example, or bring down their carbon emissions. Um, it also consults to the auto industry, though, and that's, what, that's why it's been such a poor performer year to date. Historically, its its original business was auto consulting, and people still think that that's the majority of the business. It, it's not really anymore, but it's got that legacy kind of perception on it. Um, that's one that has been yeah, a very poor performer. We think it's a bit overdone. Um, I don't think it needs an equity raise, but I think that's what the shares are suggesting. So we've added a small amount to that one as well. Do you want to take any particular ones, James? It's, um, it, 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 it is at these times really the emphasis has to be on very good management, particularly management that has perhaps been in the business for a few years, not too long, a few years, they've really got to grips with the business and and can utilize this difficult period. A, a company I would highlight like that would be Morgan Advanced. I, I think the new team, the newish team there are doing a, a very good job. And I think I, I think the success that they will come to them when the economy uh, improves. I think they'll be very well placed to um, to, to maxim to to grow their both their dividends and their earnings well further out. Um, and a newish holding for the fund um, is is ready. Um, and it's it, again the management team. It's a difficult difficult time, difficult industry. But a, a really good management team will will take should take them forward. Um, so the, the, it is about the, it's a, a relatively long list. Some of these companies will 
will ha won't recover as we think they will but that's why we need a, a relatively long list and some will recover and go up considerably from here um it, but it, i think it's so important is is management quality rather than worrying too much about what industry it is good management will be found in lots of different industries oh that, i think that's a good maxim to live by thanks well thanks very much for that um i mean it's about the little questions but we can probably ask those um separately so um thank you very much both um that's very interesting um and obviously if you want to go and read the interim accounts they're, they're on the james Thompson head site uh website so um that's all from us for this week. Um, and next week we're back with Paul Niven from FNC. And I'll have a co-host who's uh, Andrew McHattie, uh, but that'll be all explained in the email that goes out with the invite. So thank you, James. Thank you, Laura. And thank you for everybody that listened in. And if you've got any other questions, just email me. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you James. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Cheers.